All right, welcome to uh, this lesson on wilderness first aid. And uh, it's a bit of notes, and I'm going to kind of go over some things. Uh, typical wilderness first aid uh, issues that you might come come across when you're out on a wilderness trip. Now, I really want to emphasize this is in no formal training. It's very informal. I do have a wilderness first aid training myself, but that doesn't mean that you're wilderness certified trained or anything like that. But it really is more about just giving you an idea of some of the most common things. In fact, a lot of this is based on uh, my experience traveling and tripping in the bush and uh, finding out the kinds of things that typically happen when um, you're out there on a trip. So I'm going to use my pen and just kind of highlight. You don't have to write the notes down. The notes will be provided for you. And so you can just kind of follow along and then work on the scenarios that come at the end. And you can go back to these notes and look at them on your own and try to decide uh, each scenario, what the actual cause is or what what's causing it. So, and what the treatment then would be. Okay. So, in this particular uh, first incident, we have something called dehydration. And dehydration is something that can happen outside of like wilderness experiences just because people forget to drink. But when we're often in the bush, people will uh, not want to drink as much. Sometimes the filtered water doesn't taste as well. And uh, yeah, they're kind of grossed out about the idea that they're drinking water from a lake or whatever. Or they see a, a moose hang up. A pee in the lake and oh, I don't want to drink that water and so they stop drinking and then dehydration can become a bigger issue. It can also be an issue just because of the lack of available drinking water in their minds and so they, they don't do this. So the symptoms are often thirsty and dry mouth, fuzziness, uh, headaches and confusion come. For me a headache is usually a really bad sign if I get there. Uh, lack of urination or very very dark urine color is very common and the eyes can sometimes get sunken when you get really dehydrated and people will stop uh, have a difficult time sleeping and for me it's not uncommon if I dehydrate a fair bit that my muscles will start to cramp especially when I've been exercising a lot you combine those two things and, and you're in trouble so the best treatment that is out there is not to just like guzzle as much water as you can as fast as you can but to actually do it kind of more in a slow progressive manner so yes drink a half a liter of water that's a fair bit uh, 500 mils is more than a can of pop which is about uh, 385 milliliters so a fair bit of water, 500 mils immediately, and then try to slow down the drunk consumption to about 250 mils every 15 minutes. Avoid drinking sugar beverages or sports drinks as actually this can actually cause your body to dehydrate even more as uh, water is needed to move into the stomach to uh, uh uh, digest foods and waters and sugars, sorry, foods and sugars. So we don't discourage, encourage you to actually have any sugar drink if you can. Okay. So that's dehydration. The next, uh, you know, reasonably common in, uh, medical issue can be heat exhaustion. And essentially this is just being too hot, right? We don't want to get too hot out there. And usually people get heat exhaustion, they're feeling hot and tired, and it can be very easily confused with dehydration, okay? Because a lot of the symptoms are very similar. So it's a general not feeling well, dizziness and fatigue, and possibly even fainting. Muscle cramping is not uncommon, and nausea and vomiting are possible, as well as diarrhea if you get into the very extreme cases of heat exhaustion, okay? Uh, sometimes people are putting more clothing on than they think they need to or they need to. Sometimes they'll wear clothing because they don't want to get sunburned and, and that extra clothing can cause heat exhaustion and they don't realize that they're pushing their body to uh, overheat. So usually the best thing to do is get them out of the sun and into uh, a shaded area somewhere where they can kind of cool off uh, remove any excess clothing when, whenever, possible, uh, whenever possible and get them in the water if you can do so safely. It's very important that if the person is dizzy and fatigued that you don't just dump them into the water or tell them to go in there. They could collapse in the water and that's not a good thing and uh, you know we don't want to turn heat exhaustion into a drowning. So make sure it's safe. And then drink a bit of water to help them cool down especially if you can get colder water uh, available to them. Uh, the, the key thing here is just find ways to cool them down. Reducing the amount of exercise they do will also usually help, okay? Uh, you know, if you're fatiguing yourself, you're more likely to overheat.
Okay, so the exact opposite of that is hypothermia, and this exists too because we don't have the, the comfort of our nice cozy home. So hypothermia is getting too cold, and the symptoms are the person is cold <laughs> to the touch and the core. They're often shivering. Um, and the shivering will stop as the condition worsens. So shivering isn't something that just happens the whole way through. It will eventually stop. Mental judgment usually fails and physical conditions diminish. And so one of the things that they're unable to do is use their fine motor skills. You know, they can't tie their shoelaces anymore. They can't do things that require a little bit of dexterity anymore. Their speech will maybe slur and mumble and the person may become drowsy uh, with low energy. Okay, so these are really getting into the more extreme cases before a person is going to uh, pass out. Quite often, um, hypothermia, the, the worst cases I've seen is kids definitely are shivering still and they are really cold. Like it just, uh, you could just tell the person's really cold and this is not good. And they do, their energy level really starts to come, come down. That's not not uncommon to see. So remove from cold conditions as soon as possible, including wind or rain. Remove any wet clothes and replace with dry clothes because often that's what's happened is they, they have wet clothes on. Okay. Use your body heat to assist. In other words, hug them, hold them, whatever's necessary to help keep them warm. It's not a bad thing to kind of rub them. It's uh, sometimes a comforting thing, even though it doesn't really necessarily do a lot to build their body temperature, but often, you know, we'll, we'll do this. Trap their body heat using plastic or rain uh, rainwear clothes. So anything that's waterproof, if you wrap them up in it, it's, it's a much better way to, way to keep them warm and encourage activity to keep the person warm. So get them moving a little bit if you can. Uh, when we had a kid who really was experiencing some 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 hypothermia and we arrived at camp at the end of the day, their, their energy level was pretty low and they didn't have a lot of energy to move around and kind of get their body temperature up. So we got them into the tent after it was set up. We put them in a sleeping bag and told them to have a nap. We laid an extra couple sleeping bags on top of them and they warmed up pretty good. Within an hour or two, they were feeling so much better and you could just tell um, the difference. And it was largely because the kid had not brought a raincoat and that day it had rained on and off, on and off, on and off. And so they were getting cold each time it rained, it was evaporating and they were losing a lot of their heat where the kids who had raincoats did much better. So we've seen this happen before and, uh, you know, the simplicity of a raincoat can go a long way. All right, skin rashes or allergies, and this is very common, maybe one of the most common things. In fact, I, I have seen trips where 80% of the kids have some sort of skin rash or allergy to uh, various different things that are going on, bug bites and plants and all kinds of new experiences and exposures. So when you get bumps on the skin or swelling of the skin, these areas are itchy. This is uh, we're basically a rash of some sort and, it, and it's often caused by some sort of allergic reaction. So one of the things that's most important is encourage the patients not to touch it. And we apply creams like that anti-itch creams, hydrocortisone is, is very common, sometimes a little alloy. Anything to stop them from itching and touching is a good thing. And my favorite uh, treatment here is to take something called Benadryl or any other allergy relief pill like a Claritin to help reduce the body's reaction to the allergy. Benadryl is really good. The danger with Benadryl is that it will make you drowsy. And so you want to maybe consider taking it in the evening if you can get that far. So if this is happening at one o'clock in the afternoon and you've still got a, a day of paddling and whatnot, you might encourage the kids to use a, a hydrocortisone cream until we can get to camp and, you know, just settle down. And once we've got our tent set up and they're ready for, for some sleep, then you give them a Benadryl and it's like a miracle. Uh, they, they go to sleep, they have a great night and they wake up and the rash and allergies are all kind of gone. It's, it's, it's amazing stuff. Okay. Sunburn. And yes, we get a fair bit of sunburn even when we go in May. Uh, some of the worst days for sunburns have been on the Saugeen trip. Kids just don't realize, even though it's only 18 degrees out and not real hot, that you can still get sunburned. So we all know what the, the causes this. It's exposure to the sun and it intensifies as we increase exposure. The weird thing about sunburn is often you don't feel it while it's happening. It's only once it's happened that it really starts to feel painful. So it, it can be annoying. So one of the things to do is get them out of the sun, cover the skin with clothing if you can, watch for possible heat exhaustion and de dehydration, and generously apply sunscreen to the affected area. Cool the areas with water 
or a swim if possible and avoid exposure to the sun from that point on. You want to keep these areas covered all the time. Often after you've been sunburned, only uh, you know a few seconds in the sun and those skin areas become extremely uh, sensitive and they, they want to change. So sunburn is a problem. The, the, real, the real solution here is prevention. So get that sunscreen on beforehand and uh, wear uh, the clothes where you need it. Sometimes a hat with a, a little uh, bib on the back of your neck. And the other real big spot, the most common spot for sunburn, believe it or not, for canoers is actually on the tops of their knees. They're often wearing shorts and your knees and legs are stick, sticking up in the canoe and they're fully exposed. And it's not an area that is normally exposed. And so that's, that's a common place for sun, um, sunburns. Blisters. Blisters can be a real nasty thing. It's a bubble of skin with clear fluid, usually caused by a continuous rubbing of the skin. Some blisters rupture and the fluid spills out, okay? And there's always this debate, what's the best treatment, pop it or don't pop it? Well, I'm a pop it kind of guy. I'm going to pop it every time. I can't stand a blister and I don't like the feeling of it if it's not. And I know sometimes it's not a good thing to pop them, and there's a lot of debate over this, but I will pop mine whenever possible, okay? Uh, the most important thing is to stop the rubbing. Something's rubbing and it's causing this blizzard, and you have to kind of stop it. And then once you've done that, you can apply some polysporin to the area, especially if you've ruptured the blister because you've now exposed skin below that could potentially become infected, although I find it's very rare that happens. It can. And then... Apply a layer of duct tape or I call it or second skin. I actually prefer duct tape over second skin, but second skin is a, a brand product that you can buy that you, you tape right tight to your uh, blister and it, it does really help quite a bit. I find duct tape works really good because the outer surface of duct tape is quite smooth and it will usually uh, help prevent the blister from growing and getting much worse. Although, to be honest, if you can't stop the rubbing in that area, you're almost guaranteed it's going to get worse and worse. When I did backcountry uh, wilderness skiing, we would actually bring a bit of roll of duct tape right on our ski poles in case we were getting blisters. So it's a great, great product, easy to do. Okay, so uh, insect bites uh, are very common. Uh, everybody will be bitten by uh, mosquitoes at some point, black flies, horse flies, deer flies, you name it, they're out there and this can be pretty nasty. You get usually some localized swelling and itching may be accompanied with a bite mark. Uh, if a severe reaction occurs, a person in my experience, uh, experience may have uh, difficulty ble breathing, a fever, muscle spasms, and even blackout and go unconscious. I've never had that uh, happen. I've always had it uh, be pretty reasonable when we were in the bush, but occasionally uh, students uh, come to me and they want to come on the trip and they haven't, uh, uh, they tell me that they have uh, an allergic reactions to uh, mosquitoes. And I'm like, yeah, you're better off to go into Algonquin Park in August or September, not in June when we go. And so uh, it's something to consider. Now, the best treatment I find is to wash the area, apply a bug treatment like for, uh, uh, first bite I, I got down here, but uh, it, it actually, there's a after bite is the product actually, not first bite. I don't know why I have first bite in here, but after bite is a, a really good product that can be used uh, and uh, it, uh, it kind of helps calm the itching down. Hydrocortisone cream will work as well. I suspect that after bites made of the very similar products. Uh, if itching and swelling uh, do not subside and it doesn't go down, which is very not uncommon, I suggest taking a Benadryl at night and, or an allergy relief pill like a Claritin. And when you go to bed, often in the morning, it's pretty good. I've had kids that have just massive amounts of bug bites on their neck or their shoulders or their arms, and they take a Benadryl at night and they wake up in the morning and everything is gone. Now, I don't always take Benadryl and it disappears on me anyway. Most people, the inset bikes do, your body does kind of settle down and looks after them. So it's not like a guarantee that you're going to have them forever. But the Benadryl really does help, okay? And it makes you sleep better. Burns. Burns are actually one of the number one injuries that occur on camp. Uh, 
and and uh, camping trips. And basically, campfires and cooking are the most pl- common places that we get burns. People get a little too careless with the campfire, or they grab a hot pot or something that's hot from cooking. And usually, you know, right away you've been burnt. It's very hot and it's painful. And the best treatment is to get it cold in the water as soon as possible. Get to the water as quick as you can. Get cold on it, whether it's pouring water on from your water bottle or dipping it in the lake, uh, whatever it is, get cold on it. And avoid uh, bursting any blisters of these type. They tend to occur really fast. And so these type of blisters, I would not pop. Um, I try to suffer uh, suffer through them. Apply some polysporine cream and a non-stick bandage if you're putting anything on a burn area that's really bad. Avoid getting the area uh, wet often and offer a mild painkiller if it's really bothering someone. So take an ibuprofen or a Tylenol if you're having any, any problems with these. Okay. Um, lacerations or, or cuts and open sores, scrapes, all these things come together. Uh, it's usually quite identifiable. The symptom is really the one one thing we're looking for is blood. You see blood of some sort or whatever, you know that you have a cut, okay? So I, w- I, I should probably write that in here, B-L-O-O-D, blood. You got blood, you got yourself a cut or a wound, and we know that. Apply direct pressure to stop any physical uh, and stop any physical activity. You want to stop the bleeding. Don't keep them moving and running around. Uh, they used to talk about elevate. You can still elevate uh, if it's possible, but it's not uh, as uh, focused as it used to be. You know, it used to be red, um, re- uh, re- reduce uh, uh, activity, direct pressure, and E for elevate. So those are the three things, but they kind of cut elevate out of there. Uh, continue in, uh, applying pressure until the wound stops bleeding and apply porous polysporin and a waterproof bandage if possible. Okay. Wrap with medical tape. Be sure the wound is redressed at least once or twice a day and avoid contact with the water. Those are the key things. It can be a real nuisance if you cut yourself bad, uh, cut your finger with a knife uh, while you were whittling a stick at, at camp. So I really encourage kids to be very careful when they're using anything sharp, any objects that they don't cut themselves. Um, it, it, it can take a lot of the fun out of a trip. Okay. So just be careful and try to do your best not to get it. But at the same time, if you do, remember pressure, pressure, and um, get get the wound clean, a little polysporin, and that, that will be an antibacterial uh, product, okay? Sprains and strains and fractures are the last two, okay? So sprains and strains are like basically uh, uh, torn ligaments and torn muscles and usually get lots of bruising and uh, swelling with these and the joint to... Uh, in the joint area, and they often lack uh, uh, the ability to bear weight or range, uh, move in a range of motion. So you're not able to move it at uh, the joint, and uh, maybe you can't put any weight on it. It's often ankles are very common, or a knee uh, might be strained or sprained. It could be a calf muscle or quadricep that is pulled as well. So avoid movement or weight-bearing activities whenever possible, cool in the water if possible, and wrap with a tensor bandage and or tape to the joint to assist in supporting the joint. Most sprains will improve over, uh, sprains will improve over time with some activity, right? Uh, it, it's not essential that you do this, but I often encourage kids to just give it a go to see how it is. We are typically not calling in uh, a first responder unit. A helicopter's not coming to save you because you sprained your ankle a bit and you don't feel like you can walk very well. You got to be really bad before that's going to happen, and I'll talk about that at the end of this, okay? Uh, fractures, ouch. Um, they're pretty nasty if you break a bone. If it's a really bad break, you will get airlifted out. But if it's like a, a break where we're not seeing any deformity in the bone, it's most likely you're getting carried out and you're going to crutch your way out of a place uh, uh, if possible. Okay, so uh, swelling and bruising and inability to bear any weight usually uh, comes with this. Okay, so we avoid moving. We will, um, whenever possible, cool in the water and we will splint. We'll use a SAM splint and a tensor to sort of 
support the 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 limb or the the part of the body and try to uh, get you to a safe place uh, without uh, calling for support but it is possible with fractions fractures that we might if they were very severe the only time we are going to call and ask for a ref rescue is if there's a belief that your life is in intimate danger so you are most likely going to die if we don't get someone in to to rescue you so we will, you know, monitor your vitals, your breathing, your heart rate, um, blood pressure if possible. We'll keep an eye on all these things and determine whether you are able to get out of the bush on time or in a reasonable manner or not. And then 911 would be contacted if we felt that your life was at risk. All right, some medications that are often brought along on trip, and I'm, I'm just going to mention these all here so we have i usually bring ibuprofen which is advil it's a pain and inflammation treatment it'll help for some swelling i like it uh, better than acetaminophen which is also known as tylenol which is usually more of a pain medication but i do ask kids to ask them you know what is it that you use do you use at home ibuprofen or do you use acetaminophen and that's what i'm most likely going to give you when we get out in the bush because i don't want you to try a new medication for the first time if you've never uh, done it before. I even bring a little aspirin and largely because there's the odd kid who's never taken either ibuprofen or acetaminophen and so I'll just have a couple of tablets of aspirin in case. Although most of us are using Advil or Tylenol for the most part. My next favorite drug to bring along, I was probably the, my most favorite drug really, is Benadryl. Benadryl is the brand, kind of the brand name, but it is an allergic, allergic response medication. I'm allergic to bee stings and I will take Benadryl as soon as I'm stung by a bee and it'll almost 99% of the time, it's going to resolve the issue very quickly for me. I am not going to have any reactions, but uh, you know, an EpiPen would be brought along for my sake uh, in the event that I did go anaphylactic, even though it's highly unlikely if I've taken some Benadryl. Okay. Uh, hydrocortisone cream is just a type of cream that includes a little bit of a medication in it to help be an anti-allergenic, sort of like a, having a little bit of a Benadryl on a cream in it. After Bright is just a product that you, they sell for uh, after being bitten, usually by you know, some sort of annoying insect like a mosquito or black fly, and it helps to kind of calm the skin down. It just rubs on. It kind of looks like a bit of chapstick in a stick, and you can just rub it on to the specific spot. It's really quite nice. Polysporin is a antibacterial cream, and uh, it, it is usually brought along. Actually, I don't always bring polysporin because that's the brand name. I just use bring a knockoff version of it, but these are antibacterial creams that help prevent uh, infection from building. I'll even bring a little eye Imodium. Imodium is used in case a person gets some severe diarrhea. Um, that can be very dangerous because it can really help to dehydrate someone. And so we really might have to shut that down. And uh, Imodium will work really well to do that. I always uh, throw in a couple of chewable uh, antacids. Never given one of these out. Neither, never given Imodium out either, to be honest. Um, and these are just for heartburn or upset stomach. I'll, I'll give kids this. Sometimes I like to get the... Um, Oh, what's that pink stuff that uh, is a chewable pink stuff that usually comes in a liquid? It's a, a, a yeah, I forget what it's called. You, you probably know what I mean, and you're telling me the answer and saying, say it, you dummy. Anyway, I don't uh, uh, remember. Throat lozenges, sometimes a few hauls or uh, fishermen's friends in case someone gets a sore throat and it's just uh, more, more relief than anything. And then, of course, at the end, I have a, a little bit of antihistamine, which is a, a, like a claritin aller allergic reaction thing. It, it's very similar to Benadryl, and, and uh, maybe somebody's having more of a... Um, a reaction to pollen in the air and not so much bug bites, I'll give them an antihistamine like Claritin. It's something they might be familiar with. Or I'll encourage them if they know they have these kind of allergies to bring them along. Okay, so this is basically just a, a summary of all the things that we do in our course. I like kids to be aware of that these things can happen to you and uh, helps you uh, better understand some of the issues with respect to uh, wilderness first aid. And then Basically, um, you know, that's 
you know, there's not much more to uh, to it than having this knowledge will really help you. And what I've done is I've created a number of scenarios where I list a series of symptoms. I suggest to you, what is this? Is this dehydration? Is this a burn? What is it? You put the cause in up here and then you can state what you think the treatment, best treatment might be in this particular scenario. There are a whole bunch of them here. So I'm going to leave you with like, you know, 15 or 16 of them to consider. Don't spend a lot of time writing out the treatments. Just kind of put some point forms in there. And and uh, that's your, your homework to go with this particular lesson to tell me what it is you think you can do. You might also like to watch the first aid kit video where I kind of show you the physical items that go into a first aid kit. It's a separate video and I just break apart a first aid kit and show you all the particular items. All right. I hope you like this. Uh, go ahead and work on the scenarios and uh, we'll see you for the next lesson.